Hey, are you ready for vacation yet? Yep, all set. Really? That's what you're bringing? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's the essentials. The essentials. Smoke Night Live is brought to you in part by Espinosa Premium Cigars. Amp up your daily smoke with Espinosa Premium Cigars' signature Nicaraguan character. Whether you're a Maduro maniac, a Habano junkie, or simply looking to dial your flavor intensity to 11, smoke Espinosa every day. Boom, here we are, ladies and gentlemen. It is Friday night on the dojo, and as you know, Every Friday night, it's Friday Night Herf on Dojoverse.com. Grab your phone, check into your favorite cigars. Just go to Dojoverse.com. We'll be hanging out all night, all week long, as we do 24 hours a day, seven days a week, Jordan. We, we don't can't stop. stop. We don't stop. Smoking! This, ah! <laughs> this is episode 420. Oh, man. Can you imagine if mm. we had aired tomorrow? 420, 420 on 420. That'd be insane. If we didn't plan or, that. If we had a different show, maybe that'd be insane. Huh? Yeah, this would be a diff like an entirely different show. But uh, <laughs> yeah, anyways, uh, we got a great show tonight. Um, Jordan, I've been um, I've been working my way through all the mob movies. Oh yeah. And um, I I feel like I started that. You did yeah, start. You did. You, did. you started it. You started it. You got me on the on the trail. And so what I've decided to do is. I mean, I've seen almost all of these. There's only a couple maybe that I haven't seen, at least at some point in my life. But I'm re-watching them, and my 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 strategy, Jordan, is to sort of, you know, give a, a new critical eye to to each one and sort of like review them and rate them the first and compare time. them and and uh, give a little bit more um, thought into each one and try to determine. I think eventually, what's going to happen, guys is we will have a mob movie mob bracket dojo. challenge. Oh, of course. <laughs> um, but I don't want to get to that until, Jordan, I've sort of, you know, rewatched them, them again. Because, you know, when you're younger, like, for instance, uh, this week I did two two of them. Uh, this week I did Scarface, and I hadn't seen Scarface for, I've never seen it. for years and years and years. And I remember, you know, thinking... It was pretty cool, but then when I rewatched it again, I realized how bad it was. It was it was not good. <laughs> like Al Pacino's, you know, just this ridiculous caricature of a of a, of a figure, and it kind of takes you out of the movie. And all the action is really weird, and the dialogue is really bad, and the and the soundtrack is terrible. The soundtrack's and bad, huh? It nothing about that movie is good, other than the fact that it's kind of funny because it's almost like. It's it's almost silly. It's almost if it was satire. Dana Carvey. Yeah, if it was Dana Carvey, do it was ba it basically is Dana Carvey doing that character. Um, you got a little winner. That's <laughs> Tony Montano. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Uh, but anyways, but last night on the flip side, Jordan, last night rewatched Miller's Crossing. Now Miller's Crossing, Coen Brothers, their third movie, absolute masterpiece, fantastic in every way. Great movie. If you guys are watching on Facebook and YouTube, what are your what's your top mob movies? Like so far right now, here are the here are the ones that are battling for the top position. I'm not gonna say in any particular order, but obviously Godfather One and Godfather Two, mm. great movies. Dang. Then you've got then you've got um obviously Goodfellas. For me, that's that one's tough to beat. It's just so perfectly done. Miller's Crossing amazing movie here here's some of the bad ones the bad ones uh once upon a time in america absolutely disaster of a movie um like i said scarface and then of course the worst possible one of all i think jordan mm. godfather three <laughs> It's terrible. It's it is terrible. so so bad. Like, what happened? Why? What happened? Did, did, they didn't have to do it. 
You didn't have to do it. You didn't have to do that. <laughs> you could have. You could have not. I think here's here. Let me tell you what I think happened. I think this is what happened. You had Godfather one. You had Godfather two. Classic movies. Everybody loved them. Everybody knew how great they were. But then somebody in the studio, they got. They got word. They got, you know, they got the, their ear to the ground and they heard that Scorsese was making, you know, Goodfellas. And they were right. like, hey, man, we, we need to bang out. We need to compete this year. The studio needs to compete with Scorsese. We need to bang out a mobster movie. Coppola, can you do a three? Can you just somehow? And he was like, like no, I'm not doing a three. The story doesn't go that far. And then they were like, well, what if I wrote a check? <laughs> what if I wrote a check that had this many zeros on it? Could you do... Oh, sure, Godfather. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe. Yeah, was... <laughs> I got my daughter. She can play the main part. I, heck, I don't care. Yeah, you know? I was so surprised when I saw Godfather that like Al Pacino didn't seem the way that I imagined him to be because he's just very subtle, you know, like he's not overacting. And then I think after he did those two movies, like it must have been the directing in those movies that were like, no, you just, this, this role is just nice and, you know, you don't really say much. Then after that, he just let loose. By the 90s, it's been 20 years, he forgot even how to do the character. And he just brought in everything from yeah. Scarface and all these other movies back into The Godfather. Didn't he, fit he, the character. I think he was like, hey, I need you guys got to let me bring hoo-ha, some stuff to this show. <laughs> I learned how to act since the last I, time we did this, I, guys. I can I can bring some, <laughs> you know, it's like a little driving Miss Daisy scene in there. I mean, <laughs> everything about that movie was some terrible. comedy, like... <laughs> but, I'm Michael Corleone's not funny, guys. Come on. I'm sort of curious to see or hear what our esteemed guest thinks about what I've just outlined. So let's bring him on right now. We've been trying so long to make this happen, and it's been one of those things where our schedule hasn't been right or his schedule hasn't been right. But there is nobody more fun to talk to than our guest tonight, and I can't wait to bring him on the show. Uh, ladies and gentlemen... Sammy Phillips, president and co-owner of La Polina Cigars. Welcome to Smoke Night Live, my friend. How are you? My brothers, I'm here <laughs> and I am so excited. The Doja Knights are here. Yeah. Oh, I'm fired up, guys. Now, Sammy, So to hinge off of what you just yeah. said, Master Sensei, I don't know if you know this. I got to tip my hat to my, my other business partner, Clay Roberts, because Clay's father was so instrumental in exactly what it is that you're talking about. You're talking about mobsters. You're talking about that that era of movies. And his father wrote the show Mannix and, uh, you know, co-created the movie White Heat amongst Charlie's Angels and some other ones. But, you know, when the guys are like, yeah, see, that was that was Clay's father. Really? Interesting. I, yeah. I had no idea. It was crazy. Well, uh, what would you say uh, is your favorite mobster movie? That's a that's tough, man. Okay, name some ones that oh you my liked. God. Name some ones that you like. You don't have to pick them. Oh, I like the I I like the I like the I like the Godfather. Obviously, I like the Godfather, Scarface, um, a Bronx Tale. I did Bronx Tale recently. Um, no. Miller's as well. Miller's as well. No, nobody's mentioned. Yeah, I Pulp think Fiction. that's. I mean, nobody's mentioned what Pulp Fiction. Would you would do, you consider do, that? A, would we consider that to be the, a monster Reservoir like gangster yeah, style? I mean, Reservoir, yeah, Reservoir Dogs, Dogs okay. maybe could squeeze in there. Departed. Okay, now the Departed for sure, but I haven't I haven't rewatched that one yet. So that means, that means that's on my list. Yeah, and, and some other folks were Boston. saying um, uh, Road to Perdition. So that I, I have to watch that. Uh, what was that one with um, Shia LaBeouf? Oh, that what? was pretty good. You know, the Shia LaBeouf Transformers? Game. No. <laughs> Matt, <laughs> Wait, are you talking about like the, the 1920s one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not Mobster. Well, it's more than Pulp Fiction is. No, it's not. Well, it's <laughs> Lawless, right? Lawless. Lawless. Yeah. Lawless. That's not Mobster movie. Lawless. It's gangstery ish Get out of here. It's gangstery ish yeah. Is that a word? <laughs> it's gangstery ish a word? <laughs> it is now. It, with um, this much whiskey in me, it, it sure as shit is. <laughs> Speaking of whiskey, uh, it is time, um, Sammy. Uh, I'm going to pop this here bottle of Noah's Mill to get the party started because we have so much to talk about. And one of the things we have to talk about is if you are tuning into the show tonight. Hold on here. Let me see if I can get this. Okay, here we go. If you are tuning into the show tonight and participating, 
All you gotta do is participate. Make a comment. Make me laugh. Make Matt laugh. Make Jordan laugh. You or, can't make me laugh. Or not even. Yeah, it's tough to make Jordan laugh because he's such a. He's a thirty. How old are you? Thirty six. Yeah. Thirty six year old, eighty year old man. <laughs> he's an eighty year old man in a. Thirty you just made me laugh. In a thirty six year old body, but uh, nobody makes Jordan laugh. But tonight on the show, Sammy Jordan, do you want some of this? Yeah, I do. All right, pass that around. Um, tonight on the show, you guys have a chance to win an incredible prize package that is going to blow your mind. And here we go, Sammy. Uh, first off, up is a box Whoa. of the 1948 La Polina. Sammy, talk about that box. We'll talk more about the cigar later, but just give people a little bit of a flavor for this uh, prize. Yeah, I mean, I'm so proud. I'm so proud of the cigar. Uh, my boy, Corey Bappert, who's, the, as you guys know, but maybe the Dogenites don't know, is the CEO of Oliva Cigars. I went to Corey to create two special projects. One was the 125 Anios, and the other was the 1948, which a lucky Dogenite is going to receive this evening. This cigar is really, really special. And what makes it really special is the fact that we use aged, vintage Oliva tobaccos. And so the binders and fillers in this cigar are eight years old. I'm going to repeat that. They are eight years old. And the wrapper on the cigar is two and a half year aged Ecuadorian sun-grown Sumatra. And the sizes sort of deviate a little bit from what a traditional release would be these days in the premium category. So we made a Robusto, we made a Toro, Churchill, because for whatever reason, my last two releases, have, I've, just, I've just really been feeling Churchill. And then I made this special little size, I made 500 boxes of this little baby, the Diadema. And so we made some really fun sizes. Um, cigars doing incredibly well in market. And I just, I couldn't be happier with it. And I love to work with what Oliva no longer has use for, in my opinion. They've scaled so much since Corey took the business over as CEO that they have these beautiful vintage tobaccos. And he's incredibly selective about who he works with and who they do contract manufacturing for. So... Get your hands on one of those 1948s. I promise you, you will not regret it. And if you do, call the Master Sensei. <laughs> and uh, not only that, but not only will you win a box of the 1948, but the lucky winner will also win this incredibly cool Kill Bill Sweet. La Polina Triple Torch uh, Lighter. I believe it's the black one there on the left that we're giving away tonight, Sammy. Yep, there oh, it is. Right in your hot little hands. That's the one right there. Ooh, That's baby. cool. There's Bill. Mm. Dead. <laughs> you know, Eric, I figured cool. since we were here, I, I'm a little crazy and I wanted to sweeten the pot. So you guys uh -oh. keep those comments oh, no. coming. Okay. Ring it. We made a very limited quantity of the La Polina Kill Bill Zycar Cutter. Look at the action on this. Ooh. Oh, my God. It works just like every other Zycar Cutter. But <laughs> let's, let's throw this... On the table as well. Ah, fantastic. There oh. you go, folks. That's a that's a bonus. So uh, you may be asking yourselves, well, what do I do, Master Sensei Danner? Well, I already alluded to it, but all you really got to do is have fun with us tonight on the show. And especially if you are uh, smoking a La Polina tonight with us, make sure that you check in on the Dojoverse tonight with your La Polina so that we can kind of bump them in the... Uh, in the all-time leaderboard, which would be super cool. But then what's happening uh, behind the scenes, uh, if you look over at Matt there in the studio, uh, Matt is... What's he doing? He's furious. Oh, no. This is insane. <laughs> he's furiously um, typing out names uh, from YouTube and Facebook and X. By the way, we are on X. Uh, so if you are on any of those platforms and you're making a comment, you're automatically entered. And at the end of the show, folks, uh, Jordan will pick a random number and that random number uh, will just go down the spreadsheet until we hit that number, and that will be our winner. So that is how you enter. And good luck to all of you tonight, because I can tell you right now, that's over $400 uh, worth of uh, prizes, Jordan. And Insane! By the way, it should be noted that uh, Dojo employees and their family members cannot uh, win. Randy, you can't win. I want to win. You can't win, Randy. Sorry. All right, let's get right into it, uh, Sammy Phillips. Um, since we've uh, covered all of that stuff, I got to say, oh, so PCA was uh, last month, and 
it was a, a great show. It was it, like Jordan said, I think it was kind of odd because we, it didn't seem like a full year had passed. So there was a sort of a strange vibe, but I think the coolest, most interesting part of the entire show, Sammy was when late in the show, I walked into your booth with some of the other dojo guys and I don't know how to tell the story. I guess I'll just tell it in chronological order. Um, and you'll have to figure out how it really went down. But this is a true story. I walked into the booth, and I have to say, I was distracted, audience. So keep in mind, I was distracted. There was people texting me like I had another appointment to go to. And I, okay, I got to be in this other booth in five minutes. So I was distracted. And while, oh, this <laughs> while I was talking to Sam, oh, while I was talking okay. to Sammy and being distracted at the same time, <laughs> Sammy was, he was talking to me, but I really wasn't paying attention because I was so distracted. And what Sammy was doing was he had this really, really old cigar. And he had uh, cut, he had put it basically halfway up his nose because he was smelling. He was tell, talking about the smell of the cigar. crazy smell on this crazy smell. It smells like blue cheese. You guys are gonna. He's like jammed it like halfway up his nose like that. And now, unbeknownst to me, because I was distracted, <laughs> he puts it in my face to have me smell it as well. But I thought he was giving it to me to smoke, so I put it directly into my mouth. <laughs> the foot. And so right. essentially, I put I put what uh, Sammy had jammed up his nose directly into my mouth. <laughs> and so if there's some other sort of COVID going around, I for sure have it because you know it was in your oh, nose. Most definitely. But that was a great moment, wouldn't you say, Sammy? It was a great moment for me. Absolutely. <laughs> And you, you also said, I think that your comment was that this was like, um, like an aged blue cheese. I believe that's what you said, or maybe that's what I said. Yeah. Well, those, oh, well. Cig you know, that, those we cigars are, those cigars are wild because that cigar, which it was either 28 years old, 30 years old, or 32 years old at this point. And I know that when you smelled it, you were like, whoa, it's kind of got that old, like elegant yeah. funk, maybe an old pair of shoes. Yeah. That was fun. That was a fun, and I, yeah, at man. that point, I had to smoke it because I did. I had basically, you know, licked it, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So, and that was fine with me. I was cool with it. I don't think you were planning on giving me that cigar, but that's how it worked out. Um, so, anyway, that's how you get more cigars. That's the show, you just know, stick them in your mouth. Stick everything in your mouth. Stick it in your mouth. <laughs> that's how. That's how focused the master sensei is with his chi. Yeah. Is he, you know, he basically manifested all of this to get all of the cigars. <laughs> it's brilliant. I love it. All right, Sammy, let's, for folks that are watching, and we have never had you on the show um, before. What? So um, maybe it would be good to start by uh, giving us sort of a, a fun um, Reader's Digest version of the La Palina Company. Some people might be uh, unfamiliar uh, with its roots and... Uh, how it's grown and where it is today. Um, give us the, the lowdown on La Polina cigars. Absolutely. So La Polina was founded in 1896, a very long time ago. And here's a little fun fact for everybody. When you, when you look at JC Newman, and you see JC Newman's marketing, uh, which I think is very good, uh, especially with Drew Newman and where he's taking the company now. Um, there is a Chris Siglowski used to work for Thompson is a very good friend of mine. And he told me that the date variance is like there's a four month variance between the incorporation of J.C. Newman and the original incorporation of La Polina. Oh, so wow. that's how tight that was together. So my business partner, Bill, and I think most people who know La Polina from its earlier years know the Paley name and the elk of those individuals and what they were able to create. And Bill bought all of the branding back for La Polina about 15 years ago and reformed the company and the rebirth of La Polina cigars as a tip of his hat to his grandfather. And, you know, when I, when I talk about La Polina, I tell everybody that we play more than anyone that I know in, in the business. Bill is a pure cigar smoker. He gets up in the morning, stumbles downstairs, gets his cup of coffee, goes right outside and he's immediately into a cigar immediately. And, and, you know, I don't, I don't know a lot of guys that are as passionate about the business as Bill truly is. And so they formed the company in 1896. By the, 19, by the early 1900s, they were rolling and selling a million cigars a day. Wow. And during a that day? time period, you had, yeah, a day, one day, wow. no BS. 
And so that's why you have, if you go to eBay and you Google La Polina, you see all these old vintage tobacco uh, 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 boxes and sales sets. And, you know, this tobacco was from here or there. And it's, it's really an epic, amazing story. This was a Ukrainian fellow who came over. He, 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 he basically was a lector and he would read to the, to the rollers while they rolled. And he went from a lector to a, a factory manager and he learned everything he needed to know about the business and he launched Congress Cigar Company and La Polina was the paradigm and the apex of the company at the time. His wife's name was Goldie Drell, hence the Goldie that we have today and was the number two cigar of the year last year on Cigar Dojo. I love that. I'm so humbled. We will be talking so, about the Goldie uh, later in the show for sure. Yeah. Ooh, baby, get me all excited. <laughs> but so th th then what happened is they started, Bill's father graduated from Wharton. And at that time, it wasn't really a big deal. Today, if you, you graduate from the Wharton School of Business, it is a big deal. Back then, it was, I mean, like going to a regular university almost anywhere. He came in, he had these wild marketing ideas, and they started to buy distressed radio assets. And they created the La Polina Hour. And that's when the sales just went through the roof. And then they knew they had something in media. And as they were buying these uh, distressed radio outs assets, they created Columbia Broadcast. And as they were doing the radio, they were like, hold on, what's this new thing over here? And they figured out that the new thing was television. And they created CBS Television Network. Wow. And for a period of time, they owned the New York Yankees. And then they sold the Yankees to Steinbrenner. Just as an aside, if you are a New York Yankee fan, I apologize for that time in, in your uh, – baseball career because it was the it was terrible <laughs> the Yankees were terrible they sold it to Steinbrenner they scaled and then Bill re re rebirthed the company oh we down lost him he just done disappeared oh wait he muted himself wait uh, he muted himself. I lose you guys there he there is there he is he's back Rick. um my bad Right. That was actually Clay calling in. I should have <laughs> shut that off. It's an amateur junior mistake. Man, that's terrible. My God. Oh, so embarrassed. We'll forgive you. They need more whiskey. Yeah. There mm. you go. Hey, that's the way you do That'll it. That'll make it all better. And so, so the Bill, Yankees Bill, were terrible. And, all right. The Yankees, the Yankees were terrible. They sold to Steinbrenner, and they had CBS Television Network. So obviously the family did well for themselves, and – Bill just always had this in, in his craw. And I met, met Bill because I was working at the time for Alan Rubin over at Alec Bradley, and we started to make their first series of cigars. And so we made uh, the La Polina Maduro, we made the El Diario. And uh, so the first series they made was actually out of Grey Cliff, I correct myself. And then the second and the third series uh, we made over at Alec Bradley out of Rice's Cubanas. And then as the business started to scale, Bill was going through things. Alan and I, after about five years, divorced, and Bill called me. I took 30 days off, and I was just reevaluating my life. And I know you guys understand this because when you're on the, the manufacturing side of the business, it never stops. The phones never stop ringing. The emails never stop. You're always on an airplane. You're down in Honduras, Nicaragua, Dominican Republic. And for us, we, we do manufacturing, obviously, Little Havana, Miami, where the Goldie is made out of El Titan of Bronze with Sandy. Giselle and Willie. And um, prior to that, I, I worked off and on for about 12 years with Rocky Patel, first with Indian Tobacco, then with Rocky Patel Premium Cigars, launched that. And um, Bill called me and said, just promise me before you take a gig with anybody else that you'll you'll come to DC, give me a couple of days, let's talk about La Polina and the future of La Polina. And here we are today. It's been nine years and for me, uh, and you know, Master Sensei, you know this about me. I am just a straight shooter. There's no BS. It's been a very interesting build for me. There's no reason for a company our size to work with nine different factories. I should have my head examined. I, mean, I really should. <laughs> it creates all kinds of wackiness. And you guys know this. Two years ago, we had the wettest season ever in Nicaragua. But we, we couldn't cure wood, right? There was too much moisture. There was too much moisture in the cigars. Maduro was an absolute nightmare. And you're trying to set these timelines for the money that you've invested in these releases. And, um, you know, we, we do what we do. We love what we do. And I think that what I like to tell people about La Polina is we're having a lot of fun doing what we love to do. And there's not another company that I know that is working with nine different factories. 
And so when you yeah. talk about us working with GCC out of Hatsa and also out of the Dominican Republic, working with Raices Cubanas, working with El Pariso, working with the Placentias, working with Rocky Patel out of Nicaragua, working with Hoya de Nicaragua out of Nicaragua, um, oh, El Titan de Bronze, Pages, and Garmendia. And those are the factories that we're working with right now. Who aren't you working with? Yeah, geez, that's a, that's a shorter list. Uh, uh, who aren't you working But actually, there- All to this. Uh, <laughs> Sammy, there, there, is, um, there is sort of also, uh, while you say that is a, a tricky thing to maneuver, and I can imagine that it would be working with that many factories, but there's also an advantage, I would think, also in the sense that- um, you you know if 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 a factory or farm is struggling, they had a, an off year or two, that kind of thing. Um, you you you're you're a little bit more dispersed, and maybe that is also a advantage. Yeah, I agree with you, and I, I got to tell you, you know, Master Sensei, we are so. We, I I would like to think that we're so forward thinking. And I'll let you in on a little secret. And I can see like 131 Dogenites right now. We just purchased six years of Goldie Future Wrapper. That's how committed we have been to, to the craft. And it's, I think that, you know, I'm drinking a glass of wine right now. And I think that it's pertinent because one of the things that we don't talk about in this business is vintage. And so when we go into market and we talk to our consumer base at a, at a retailer, whether it's mom and pop or it's a massive store, what we don't talk about is vintage. Well, why does this cigar taste a little bit different than it would? You would never expect that a bottle of, I'll just use a, a name that I think most people would know, Jordan Cabernet from 2017 would taste like Jordan Cabernet in 2021. And I think that we get lumped in with, obviously the Dogenites are here tonight. They want the education. They want to talk about something new. They want to meet somebody new or they know La Polina and they love La Polina, or they're like, you know, saw your little write-up on me and maybe they know that, you know, possibly if I drink this whole glass of wine that I'll do Eric Espinosa. I mean, <laughs> they, they, they actually could be here just to hear me do Espinosa. Um, but, but in all seriousness, um, you know, the education that I received at Rocky Patel and working with the Placencia is at a very, very young age, working with their master roller who taught me how to roll cigars, Yvonne, who has since moved on, but my love for Nestor Sr., Nestor Jr., Gustavo and Jose Luis just go, and even Javi now. I mean, those guys are my family. And I know that you guys understand this because there, there is a group of individuals that play incredibly well in the sandbox. And that love and admiration we have for one another is unlike any other business that I've ever like sort of navigated in or been in other than whiskey. The whiskey guys love each other. There's very little competition amongst them. They all drink each other's stuff. And then as they so eloquently say, and then they all piss it out. But, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, what you guys do, and I want to tip my hat, and, and and again, I'm a straight shooter, man. You know, what you provide every Friday night for everybody that's on here and that is tuned in or is going to watch a rerun, it's invaluable. And, you know, you and I have had this conversation before. I have the utmost respect for what it is that you provide. I think that we have an incredible lack of credible media in this premium category and it's what you guys are providing and you're providing it in a format that not a lot of people are doing and can do and it's no bullshit it's straightforward and i i, I really love what you guys are doing i really truly do and it's well, special you. so uh, everybody cheers, here should know cheers, that it is special cheers to that everybody let's uh, raise a glass uh thank you sammy hey sammy um that was a, that was a great rundown of the uh of the la polina history I have a follow-up question. What were you doing before the cigar industry, before you personally got into it? And how did you personally get into the industry? So not to burn too much time, um, and I hate to drive people to my Instagram because I think it's a little weird, but there's a little snippet of how I got into the business there. Uh, my, my marketing guy, Todd, I, I think you guys met him last year when we were doing painting all the Kill Bill shoes in the booth. He's an incredible artist, and he came down. He's like, I want to interview you for an hour, which turned into two hours, which he now cut down to about 40 minutes. But the long story, very, very short, is my father came home. I was 15 years old. He was um, It was his bachelor party. My mother and father, who were still very good friends, were divorcing. And a uh, big shout-out to, uh, to my pops. But he came home, and he's like, you got to try this. And I'm telling you, like, when I tell you it was probably – 
what I call the ass end of a cigar was probably that much. And at that point in my life, I had not smoked anything. You guys know what I'm talking about. It's almost 420. And <laughs> what had happened was my dad said, Sammy, you got, you got to try this. I'd never smoked a cigarette. I'd never smoked a cigar. And my dad said, you could try this. I'm not putting that in my mouth. And my dad said, don't be a, you can hit the beep button, kitty cat. You're right. Smoke yeah, the cigar. And I smoked the cigar and I fell in love. And my first cigar, there were three flavored cigars in the market at the time. And uh, I was 15 years old. And there was a West Indies uh, vanilla, there was an Island Amaretto, and there was the Caribbean Rum Runner all coming out of Tropical at the time that really no longer exists in the, in the form that it did. And then the fl- obviously with Lars Tetons coming on the scene in 1995 really hard and Jew Estate coming on the scene in, the work, in 1996. <laughs> you got you to grind it out. <laughs> and so, so, I was, so these guys ended up hiring me. Uh, I would go in, and it was this beautiful place in Naples, Florida called Heaven. They had 180 different microbrew beers from around the world, 250 different types of wine, champagne, and port. And I would go in and buy my cigars, and one of the guys said to me, because to answer the question, I was working in the restaurant business. I'm born and raised in the hospitality business. And I think it, 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 I'm a little bit different from a lot of the guys um, that you'll interview because my entire life was was based on what things smelled like and what things tasted like. And that was huge in my house. You were allowed to take a sip of the wine. You're allowed to take a sip of the cognac or the whiskey, and you could order anything that you wanted at the restaurant. My father's rule was you had to finish it. So mm. whether it was prime rib, whether it was a rib chop, whether it was you know roasted chicken, it didn't matter. The old man was like, you can have it, but you got to finish it. And so my approach to cigar making is a little bit different, I think, than most of the guys you talk about. Like when we talk about Pete Johnson, Rafael Nadal, uh, Abe Flores, uh, Matty Booth, John Huber, these guys all came out of music. And so rhythmically, they're looking, right, if a lot of them are bass players. Don't know why. Uh, Nick Perdomo, drum player. Rocky <laughs> yeah. played the drums. Michael Herklotz plays the drums. So, I mean, we're talking about serious premium cigar makers here. Yeah. And they tell me that when they're blending a cigar, all they're thinking about is that rhythm, how a song comes together, how that bass line is going to work in the song. And for me, it's totally different. I approach the cigar making business like you and I would say, all right, well, we're going to have a chili cook off. So it's the master sen- sensei versus Sammy. I'm going to bring blah, 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 mine. Do you have beans in your chili? Is it meat in your chili? Whatever that base is. And that's how I construct, deconstruct, and reconstruct the blends that we that we make for La Palina. Let's talk about three of those blends. We talked about the 1948 a little bit already, which is what we're giving away on the show tonight. But I want to talk about three in particular. Um, let's start with this that I'm smoking right here, the... Uh, 125. Let me see if I can get a focus on this bad boy. Is that what you're smoking too? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna light it up right now. That's what I'm smoking too. This thing is oh, this oh, thing is amazing. Baby. Uh, Dang good. Tell folks about this particular cigar. It has got some nice, it tastes like aged sweetness. Like if you were a, very sweet. If you were imagining what um aged like in your mind, you think of oh, I I, I can imagine what really good aged tobacco tastes like. Th- that's what I get from this. It, there's that sweetness, like the tobacco has been broken down and where the oils are just remaining and you're getting kind of that luscious, oily kind of sweet notes, a little bit of slight bit of leathery kind of flavor to it. But this is an absolute banger of a stick. Talk about this uh, cigar, Sammy. Absolutely. So this was, this was really what had happened was uh, Fred had just purchased Oliva and we were all at a multi-vendor together and we sat and we just we vibed we had a great night man a lot of wine a lot of talk all kinds of different cigars and Corey had just taken over as ceo and like i said we came up in the cigar game together we have a wonderful relationship and i called Corey and i was like you know man this is kind of out of left field but what do you have that's super vintage and he said well why don't you know why don't you come down to the factory and let's and let's play when I got down there, we were able to inspect these incredible vintage Oliva tobaccos. The youngest tobacco in this cigar is five years old. This is what I call NBS. It's no, get the button ready. It's no bullshit. <laughs> and so, it's perfect. It's perfect. Yes. And so. It worked out that you know, time, Jordan. You know, <laughs> Usually I'm like three seconds late. <laughs> Damn. Damn it. Oh, see ya. So. I love you guys. So what happens is you go down and what, what Eric, what we do is my, my approach to this is, okay, what do we want the cigar to look like? What do we want it to taste like? When you look back at vintage Oliva or you look back at vintage La Palina, 
<clears throat> and you look at the embossing on that band, the, if you look at the Excelente series, that's the Excelente's band. We just modernized it lightly. And where it would say Excelente's, that's where it says the 125 años. And so we went down and we said, we want to tip our hat to 125 years of mm -hmm. the existence of this intellectual property of this company. What are you thinking? And I said, well, we've got Goldie and Goldie is incredibly special. And I want to create something with more body, with more flavor, but not too much. I think when you guys did the intro, I love to smoke Espinosa cigars. And Eric and I not only have been like really, really close friends for over 20 years, I love his cigars. You know, so when you talk about the 601, when you talk about when the, the, the initial Cubao and the Murcielago, I fell in love with what it what he and Eddie at the time were doing and then what he has done since with Junior. So I didn't want it to be as heavy as what people would be smoking, like what Nick Melillo is making now, and I have a lot of respect for Nicky. I love his ta tabernacle, not the Havana Seed, the OG. And, oh, you don't you like know, the Havana Seed? Mm. I love it's not, my, it's not my jam, man. I, lo I, I love, love it. Jam, I love the 142, man. Anyway, all going. right. I'm gonna. Re <laughs> I'll revisit. I'll Sorry. revisit it. That was our number so, one cigar of the year that year. Yeah. 2018, Dude, I think. Yeah. Listen, po I I really had to, and right, I know Sam, this is sort Sam, of. Sammy just lost uh, all. He's off the show. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Hey, bro, I mean, it wouldn't be the first time I'm kicked off a show and it won't be the last, but no, man, I, 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 you know, I go out in the market and I buy Tabernacle, uh, Charter Oak, um, yeah. uh, the Olmec. And as far as Espinosa's concerned, I smoke all his stuff. I just post COVID, I was not able to smoke fuller bodied cigars. Like I used to smoke fuller bodied cigars. And so when we went to make the 125 años, I wanted something that was going to be medium bodied. And for me, it's more more than body. It's really about flavor. Yeah. Right, and so when right. I go through exactly what you said, and you're talking about the sweetness that exists in here, we're talking about tobacco that's been aged a minimum of five years. That's the youngest tobacco in this cigar. And it's a Nicaraguan Puro. And it's all vintage Oliva tobaccos. And I think it's so special because these guys go into market and they buy a Milano or they buy, but they buy a V and or they buy that Connecticut, which I think they make a very good Connecticut. And they're just it's scale. They're just a beast. And so for us, we want to make the best possible cigar that we can for that experience. And that's why I think the 125 is, is so special. Now, on the uh, before we go to commercial, we'll talk about one other cigar. And I'm I'm sort of tempted to not even do this segment, Jordan, for personal reasons. Okay. Um, because, <laughs> because I don't want it to go away. Um, back in, what was it, 2011, Jordan, or 12, uh, the, the, the cigar that everybody was trying to get their hands on was the Goldie Number no. 2, which was an absolutely phenomenal cigar. And then, and then you guys followed phenomenal. it up. <laughs> phenomenal. There we go. And then you followed it up with the Number 5, which was also really good. But then this past year, 2023... You guys came back out with the number five, the Goldie number five, which I'm showing in my hot little hands. And now I don't know what. Ha now, first of all, I love the OG. Uh, so what, what I'm about to say, don't take it the wrong way. But something about this re-release is just absolutely knocks it out of the ballpark. This cigar grabbed us at the beginning of 2000. When, it, when you guys first started selling this and I bought a a box from, I think, Smoke In at the time. And I got it, and I was like, oh, I know I love this cigar. It's going to be great. And then I smoked it, and I was like, Jordan, it's, it's, really it's <laughs> better than it was it before. Like, it is so freaking phenomenal. I don't know how many oh, of these are left. Phenomenal. And I, I hope that none of you guys go out and buy these right now because do save them for me because <laughs> I will continue to buy, personally buy boxes of these for the rest of my life and be happy. But the Goldie series, it... This is one of the best cigars I've ever had in my life. I can't recommend this thing higher, and I'm not BSing anybody on this thing. But talk about the Goldie series, Sammy. Absolutely. So, you know, Goldie, Goldie was released, um, like the Master Sensei is saying, and I do have a box uh, right here of the Goldie Prominente. I wasn't sure what I was going to smoke tonight or not smoke tonight. 
So when you look at the Goldie Prominenti, this is the the PCA series. We made we made five hundred boxes of this, and so Bill had always kept private stock, and so we we had gotten to a point where Goldie was was all anybody was asking for, and I think that there's there are times where you hit this rare magic, and and you know I did this at Alec Bradley with Alan Rubin. We tried to create something that was incredibly special and fine and rare. And with the, the Seasons collection that we did at Rocky Patel. And Fine and Rare did very well, and Seasons did very well. Why a cigar hits the way that it hits and how that it hits, nobody ever really knows. And so there was this amazing woman. Her name was Maria Sierra. She used to be Fidel Castro's personal roller. She used to work um, you know, at the Cohiba factory. Oh, Okay. Sorry, there were police in front of the house. My wife just held up a note. And, oh, geez. Okay, get well, your pistol, if, honey. If, if, if Sammy <laughs> gets like, pulled away, if Sammy gets pulled away, what's happening here? <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. But uh, if you got to go, um, let no, me know. But it, no, no, we're fine. Plus, my wife got into my my family. My father in law and mother watch are watching right now. But we got into archery real serious about a year ago, oh, and terrible. she's she's the best of all of us. And she could hit anybody from like sixty yards away, so I'm, I think we're safe here. Can you imagine that? Um, just get, imagine that for a second. You're like, you're like carjacking somebody out in front of a house, and you get shot in the head with an arrow. <laughs> I have <it> great. <laughs> we're going old school. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so back to Maria Sierra. The only cigar that Maria rolled from the time she came into the into the United States of America and at all tight into bronze to her retirement was Goldie. Yeah. And she rolled at an incredibly methodical, methodical pace. And she was one of the most brilliant rollers you would ever have laid your eyes on. She was soft spoken, incredibly in like Dexter psychotic about how those cigars were rolled. And I think we were one of the original comp companies that started working with real Medio Tiempo. Like if you walked into ETB today and you said to Sandy, I'd like to see the Medio Tempo, she'd say, all right, well, I got to call Sammy, Claire, Bill, but yeah, sure, we'll show it to you. And it is, again, NBS. And so as that scaled, each year there would be between 500 boxes to 1,500 boxes, dependent upon the tobacco that was available that year. And so when I tell you, my friend, that this has been one of the most incredible, great challenges of my career is to every year go down and recreate Goldie. Like I said before, if you think about wine, you would never take a 2017 vintage and expect it to taste like a 2021 vintage. So for you to say what you're saying, we're always trying to improve. We're always trying to make it better. And we make it and we make it for us. We don't we don't make it for the market. We're we're just trying to say I think this needs a little bit more or this needs a little bit less. And so we in the last 5 years we've been we've become incredibly like Dexter psychotic about Goldie, the way the rapper tastes, the way the rapper smells. And we have to make, and we pivot, Eric. It's like if we're getting rapper from ASP or we're getting rapper from Oliva Oliva, not Oliva Cigar Company, we had to go outside of the scope for Ecuadorian Sumatra for the last two years because we knew El Nino was coming and we knew that Ecuador, what the yield of rapper was going to be in Ecuadorian Habano from here and it was going down here. And there's a lot of guys like Rocky and Oliva and Espinosa, Aganorsa, they're all using product out of Ecuador. So every year we try to recreate something that we love, that we know is going to do well in market. And I got to tell you, I'm, we're really humbled that we were the number two cigar for Cigar Dojo. And I know how serious you take your craft. And it's, well, again, it's know, really humbling. The, the, a couple of cool things about that particular cigar. <clears throat> one, one interesting thing that... Um, that Maria would do was she would only roll a specific Vitola for like what a year or, or until that, that run. Yeah, she had to take like a week off if and she wanted to switch sizes. And, and if there was a change in Vitola that, that Maria needed to do, like maybe we're going on to the, you know, to the Lancero version of it. Well, not wasn't a Lancero, but it was like a, what was the, the one that came after five? It was, it was almost like a double Corona or something. But anyway, she would take a whole week off just so that she could sort of refocus herself and then, and then she would get into that run of Goldies. Um, but it seems to me that you guys have been able to uh, maintain the quality of the cigar. And 
but the flavor, I mean, it's it's right up my alley, Sammy. That's that Oof. is that is my it tastes like bone marrow. It, that baby. is my sort of jam in in a nutshell. If somebody said to me, "Hey, Eric, what's what's your preferred, you know, um, sort of flavor profiles, uh, so to speak?" I'd say, "Oh, it's 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 the Goldie." Whatever and this, that Goldie Five is, and this Goldie <laughs> Five, man, is just and. So anyways, guys, do please don't buy any of those. Just don't don't go to any of the outlets and try to buy any of that because I'm hoping that I have enough of those to last the rest of my short little life that I have remaining, Sammy. But uh, after the break, um, we got some cool stuff to go over. Uh, but before we get to there, ladies and gentlemen, this show is sponsored by JR Cigars, one of the world's largest online cigar stores. JR's inventory ranges from everyday bundled cigars to incredibly high-end boxes plus a large selection of cigar accessories. Enjoy the best prices on your favorite brands, such as Romeo y Julieta, Monte Cristo, Crown Heads, Davidoff, Espinosa, and many more. Make sure to try one of their exclusive lines, such as the Drew Estate Nightshade, or my personal favorite, the Cigar Dojo 10th Anniversary Champagne by Perdomo. Celebrate over 50 Baby. years and stock up on your favorite cigars today. Smoke Night Live is also brought to you by Espinosa Premium Cigars. Espinosa Cigars was the Cigar Dojo's first ever Cigar of the Year award winner, and since then they've consistently placed their cigars on our coveted year-end list, placing more than any brand in the last decade, Jordan. Whether crafting a full-bodied Maduro at the San Latino factory or whipping up a zesty Habana at the fan-favorite La Zona factory, or heck, even serving up a knuckle sandwich with Guy Fieri, Espinosa packs the flavor that cigar craft fanatics crave. I think I missed those two words up. Get in the Lazona state of mind with hit releases such as the 601 Blue, Espinosa Habano, Murcielago, or the opulent orange treat that Eric Espinosa himself has dubbed La Range. With a lineup this good, you'll have no excuse but to smoke it. Espinoza every day. Ladies and gentlemen, this is episode 420 of Smoke Night Live. We are chatting with none other than Sammy Phillips of La Polina. We've been going down the history of La Polina, the history of Sammy Phillips. And not only that, we're going to give away some stuff tonight. Yes, indeed, ladies and gentlemen, a full box of the 1948 La Polina and the cool Kill Bill Triple Flame. There it is. The black one there, triple flame, torch lighter, and Sammy threw in a uh, Zykar uh, Kill Bill uh, cigar cutter as well. All you have to do to enter to win is just comment on the show tonight. Participate. Have some fun with us. That's all we ask, Sammy. We don't ask much more than that. <laughs> That's it, baby. <laughs> Come on. Make a comment. Like something. There you go. What's the deal with people not liking things anymore on social media? It's like they saw it. But they didn't like it. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, yeah. Because everything's tracked, I guess. I don't know. Uh, Sammy, uh, it's been a, a long road for you. You've met everybody in the industry. How has this industry changed, you know, since the time you kind of got into it and got your feet wet with Rocky and, and Eric and until now? Well, here you are, co-owner of La Polina. What's changed? How's it? What's the landscape like these days? It's crazy. It really is. Um, I think that it is the best time in history to be a cigar smoker. Mm. And I think it is the most fun time in history to be a cigar maker. I think the things that you know were going on during the cigar boom, which is when I got involved in the industry. I mean, this is my 27th year in and around the premium cigar sector. And what I do see is not what I saw, I'd say, 15 years ago. And it's a little, actually, it's disheartening for me because there's not a lot of youth coming up in this category. There's not a lot of young guys that are making cigars and entering, uh, you know, entering into the, into the business. Like, I'll give you some names here. Uh, uh, Matty Booth, uh, George Rico, uh, John Huber, when he went out on his own from CAO, Tim Osinger, you know, these really young, youthful cats, Dion from Illusion, Pete Johnson from Tatawai. And I was a part of that, and I have so much respect for those guys because at least they had the the cojones <laughs> to you know put their put their cojones on the table and say, you know what, I'm not going to work for anybody else. I'm going to go and I'm going to do this myself, and I'm going to make cigars for myself, and I'm not really going to worry about the ratings, and I'm going to go 
and hit the road and introduce this product person by person by person. So I just don't see, you know, you've got Alec and Bradley, who I think now are working for General, but we'll see what happens with them. Um, there's another young guy who makes cigars out of all Titan Kyle that I just met. I don't know him very well. Yeah, but he's a young cat that's coming up. There's just, you know, during that era, you had Jonathan Drew, you had Marvin Samuel, you had um, Philip Wynn, right, from Philippe Gregorio. You had Osigner, what he was doing. You had Tony Borhani with, with Bahia, Rocky Patel, Alan Rubin. And then hinging off of that, Pete Johnson, Dion. Uh, Johnny Huber, Mike Condor, I mean, these amazing, amazing guys. So I don't see a lot of youth coming up in the game. Um, and that to me is crazy because I love, I love this industry. I think you got to be a little bit crazy to, to build your career in it. So that says something about me. You know, Sammy, one of, <laughs> one of the interesting things I always find to be probably a challenge for brands and, and you can respond to this and, and tell me if I'm way off base or not, but the premium cigar in industry is so uh, I interesting, the consumer base at least, because you have these cigar nerds, the doji knights, that they, they follow everything, that they're interested in the tobacco, they want the narrative, they want to try new things, hybrid leaves, they want to see, you know, Cameroon grown in Honduras, and they're into every sort of aspect of it. And then you have the vast majority of cigars that get sold to just people that are they're going to a wedding, they're playing golf, they don't pay any attention to to the the narrative so much. They're just looking at the shelf. They walk into a um a brick and mortar and they they look at the shelf and then and they pick something. How do you balance, you know, marketing to the the cigar nerd and then also appealing to the Joe average guy that just comes into the cigar shop that probably represents the vast majority of cigar sales? It's a, that's an incredible question. And, you know, Rocky's, I don't know, Rocky's going to do like 85 million bucks this year. He's, he's just a monster now. Alan sold his company for $72.5 million. Um, and marketing for both of those companies, both in sales, uh, but mo mostly marketing for both of those companies. The, you know, we, when we run the metrics on our side of the business, we know that, that 85 to 90% of the category, Master Sensei, is the guy that you're talking about that walks in on a weekend or picks up a box of cigars to go to a, a wedding or some instrumental, you know, quinceanera or a, or a bar mitzvah, uh, or he's going hunting or he's going fishing. That's, the, that's most of the guys. We, never, we will never see them. They are not the fanatics. They are, they are not the dogenites. But what happens is if you can connect with the tobacconist, and this is why your platform is so important, and you've got somebody who walks in who comes in and he says, I want brand X. And he wants brand X because they've been in business for 127 years and his grandfather smoked it and his grandfather's grandfather smoked it. Or they're set on massive brands like Fuente, which make – very good cigars, Padron, excellent cigars. I think that you have a moment to connect with that individual. And the way that you build this brand is online, having people like yourself that are exposing cigar makers, people that are passionate about their craft, and then hinging off of that, it's, dude, it's one stick at a time. That's what it is. You Catching know, somebody in a humidor. I think that's good. I think that's interesting. And I would say this too, I would add that, for for the folks that are watching, the folks that are watching, you guys are a bigger driver than you think because really what happens is the cigar nerds, the guys that watch this show, the guys that are like super into it, they're the ones that are probably have their, you know, the ear of the tobacconist. And so as they have their ear, you know, their, their local tobacconist and they're saying, hey man, like you got to bring in the Goldie. Like I, 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 you know, I really love that cigar, you know? And then, so they bring that in, which then exposes the guy that is not paying attention. So like, it seems to me that, that the cigar nerds drive the industry, even though they're a small segment, they probably drive it a little more than they think that they do. This is, this is all about the power of five. 
I promise you it's about the Power Five. If there's one guy in a humidor, let's call it Bob's Tobacco Shop, not everybody is big delicious, right? Not everybody is going to be Abe DeBabna. They're not going to have the savvy of Abe DeBabna. They're not going to be able to go into a room and captivate the room like Abe DeBabna. We all love Abe. He's phenomenal. But not everybody is that guy. Is that Juan Cancel? <laughs> yeah. Is that Juan? Oh, yeah, Juan, Poppy, what's up, Poppy? <laughs> so I knew Juan when he was a cop. I yeah, swear to God, too. you guys are you guys are freaking great. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. So, um, you know, life. if it's – it is indeed Terrence. <laughs> God, I love Terrence Riley. So – you guys are fucking crazy. So, um, you know, that's how I see it. If you go into Bob's Smoke Shop and some guy says, you know, I just smoked this La Paluna Goldie and I picked it up because of Master Sensei. And then I went in and I loved it. And then somebody says to him, what are you smoking? He says, dude, I'm smoking the La Paluna Goldie. Or I'm smoking the Tabernacle. Or I'm smoking Mildias. That one guy can turn your brand around. Mm, right. Can make your brand into a winner. Because it is one person at a time, it is one store at a time, and it is one experience at a time. That's just what it is. And speaking of all these experiences, uh, and and Abe DeBabna is a good example of that sort of that cigar personality that people are so familiar with. And it was at a time that you know, the, like you mentioned, you know, Jonathan and Pete, you near know, the famous um, was it Cigar and Spirits or Cigar Journal. Uh, uh, yeah. Cover Jordan, the, the cover, the cover. No, 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 right? it wasn't. It was um, Thor. It was Thor Cigar Press. That's right, Cigar uh. Press. Sorry, Thor, if you're watching, I apologize. But there was a time, uh, Sammy, when the sort of like the cigar personality was such a, a a main factor. It seems like maybe that's waned a bit. There's not doesn't seem to be quite as much, but there is still the guys. There's the Alpha Dog. There's the Erica Spinoza. That is like Abe in the sense that he can command a room, and nobody in this industry does a better as Eric Espinoza than than you, my friend. You are literally the Eric Espinoza doppelganger. <laughs> uh, maybe not by looks, but by sound. And I would be remiss if I didn't <laughs> ask you to uh, give us some Eric Espinoza on this Smoke Night Live episode. So here's uh, my lead into the Espinosa thing is that Eric and I have known each other for, for 25 years. We're incredibly, we're incredibly close friends. Um, and I mean, incredibly, Eric called me before he launched Espinosa cigars. He and Eddie had separated and I don't even know if the Doja Knights would, would, would remember Ortega. Um, but I think that when you grow in this business like this, you, you have a respect for your fellow manufacturers and, and more so for your friends. So Eric calls me. He's like, I'm going to launch Espinosa cigars and I need you to do me. And I was like, what the, are you, what? <laughs> he's like, I need you to do me. And I said, Eric, bro. He goes, no, no, no. I need you to do me while I do me on stage. You know how good he is with words. And so, I mean, how could I turn him down? He's launching this brand and I, and I cheer for these guys. And I know that if you ever see somebody launch a brand, like Nick Melillo or Michael Herklotz or Steve Saka, you will always see guys like Pete Johnson immediately get in there and go, I'm rooting for you, bro. Congratulations, bro. Because he knows how hard it is. Right. And after Rocky, uh, Rocky really changed the game, man. Rocky changed the game because Jose Oliva told me before he sold the company, he said, Rocky Patel made us get off our fat asses and go to work. And so we had to go from store to store to store because we knew that this wild Indian guy was going to go out there and he was just standing in that humidor for eight hours. He was going to hand sell the cigars. And so in saying so, Eric called me and I got up before Marvin Samuel to speak and I did Eric Espinosa. And from there, it's, it was really, it was an inside thing where we could actually mess with people in the industry where I would call while they were sort of with Eric and Eric would leave and then I'd call him and do something crazy. So here's a little Eric Espinosa. And as I promised you boys, I had to finish the glass of wine before I did it. All right, here we go. My claim to fame. <laughs> Listen, everybody, the bottom line is, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, 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 all you guys at the Cigar Dojo, the Dojo Nights, whatever Sammy <laughs> calling you tonight, it don't it don't really matter because basically what happens is this in the business, okay? So, so, you know, you got like fancy things. They don't mean nothing, okay? Now, fancy is stupid, okay? It's just stupid. 
when I was driving for UPS, they told me there was a lot of colors walking brown through for you. So I said, this is like a number. Just You got to go with numbers, okay? So I was rolling down, and I, I was in Miami because I live in Miami. That's what I do, you know. Uh, so what happens is I, I'm going down. I'm like, oh, man, we're on the 601 block. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And he's like, but let's keep it easy, though. You know, we're going to make a, a blend. Is it like a little, uh, 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 is, it, is it a little blue? Maybe we do a, uh, 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 we do a red too, and then we do the, the green because you know green is money. And I'm gonna tell you right now, you Doja Nights, okay? The only one guy who can do me that's Sammy Phillips because back it, you know, I, I tell them all if they do me, I I, I crack them, I crack them. I'm hitting the gym. I hit the heavy bag tonight. And that is Eric Espinosa. Oh, hey, that was uh... that's insane. That was next level. I should have had like I should have just had like an Eric face I could have put up. That on was there. next ah, level. That's crazy. I did not know what to expect. I cannot believe that. All right, hold on, hold on. So you could do the Terrence Riley thing, all right? Six oh one. This is the greatest night of our lives. Oh, I missed it. This is the greatest night of our lives. Hey, Terrence, you looking for a job? Uh, uh, maybe I, I, I hire you. You know what I'm saying? Because uh, you know, uh, I need somebody on the road like 300 days a year. You're the guy. You're very good. At, very lean. You look like you would cheat. <laughs> this is the greatest night of our lives. <laughs> oh my gosh, that was now, folks. I that love was it. worth. That was worth the price of admission. Right, <laughs> That's right there. Crazy. Was, there was nothing better than that. <laughs> No, nobody does it better, Eric, than you. There's a lot of guys that, that try. There's a lot of folks that try, but uh, I don't even know if Eric does as good as Eric. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to give you guys like the whole thing because what happens is, you know, I don't know. You're, you know, so what I typically do is, I want to twist this up. It's like. <laughs> I gotta like stick out my belly. And I'm like, you know, bro, I've been hitting the gym like really hard. I got a new blend coming out. It's called the Big Poppy. For one can't sell. I'm making cigar. You know what I'm saying? I I I gotta, I gotta hit the heavy bag. <laughs> oh my! You God. know this this stuff. This stuff is so funny because like outside of a a, a dirty, wild, dingy cigar event, this smoke filled room. <laughs> they're like do eric espinosa and like who the hell is eric espinosa <laughs> they don't they don't know outside of the business they're like what's your claim to fame and i was like you know an ashtray at cigar fest and eric espinosa <laughs> um mad just madness uh sammy we have got to give away some prizes um Let's Matt, do it have you been uh calculating I'm over here yeah, uh, calculating the um, the entries. Do you know approximately how many we have tonight? All right, I've got fifty nine written down. Fifty nine. All right, fifty nine of the folks that have uh, participated and caught Matt's eye. Uh, we apologize if we didn't get you in there. We tried our best to get everybody in there. We we've, we've done everything we can. And what we're gonna do is uh, Jordan will pick a random uh, number on the randomizer. And Random we'll go miser. down the list. We'll pick that winner. Uh, I will contact you after the show, and you'll give me your address. I will pass it along to Sammy, and the prize will show up on your door um, in the next week or so, whatever. Uh, are you boys ready? All right, Jordan. Here we go. This could be the greatest night of your life. Your life. Terrence Riley. Your life. <laughs> I keep starting up new music. All right. We need a drum roll. There we go. God, I got to I have to get myself back together after that Ooh. impersonation. That was crazy. I like it. But this is the real drum. Number, Number nine. nine. Ooh, Number see. nine. So Matt will go down the right list. Now. Who that? Uh, Number nine. Joel Wage. Joel Wage! From from, he's a YouTube. He's a YouTube watcher. Joel, what? Wage. Wage. Joel, Joel Wage. What was that? Congratulate. Congratulations, Wage. Joel Wage. <laughs> you are the winner. By the way, folks, um, don't lose heart because uh, Sammy and I talked on the phone today, and uh, we have some other stuff planned uh, in the near future, the next uh, month or two. And so uh, we do have some other cool stuff to Ooh. give away from La Polina, but we'll give you guys details of that when that happens. What? Until then, congratulations to Joel Wade. Uh, Sammy, um, 
<laughs> I, I can't thank you enough for uh, being on Smoke Night Live on a Friday night, taking the time to hang out with us. Uh, it's been an amazing show. Uh, I got to tell everybody, get your hands. I mean, don't don't sleep on the Goldie. Yeah, I know. I told you not to buy it. But the truth be told, if you can get your hands on it, it is literally one of the best cigars that you will smoke. I guarantee. In fact, if you don't like it, you can. I will buy it from you because I buy those boxes all the time. The the one twenty five Jordan absolutely Dang, a phenomenal stick. Phenomenal. Uh, don't sleep Thank on you. La Polina, folks. Um, grab some. Tell your local tobacconist if they don't carry them to bring them in, because that's how this works. Uh, it works by finding the best cigars out there and um, spreading the word. So um, please, please tell your local tobacconist to do that because it really does help keep the show going. And we do appreciate Sammy. Sammy. Uh, by the way, uh, before we say goodbye to Sammy, uh, Wednesday night, Jordan, Wednesday night, Flavor Odyssey returns. We go Cuban, baby. Uh, we have been going up the uh, most checked into brands on Dojoverse.com, the top 32, and this coming Wednesday is Cubans. So I know not everybody has a Cuban to smoke, but if you do find a drink pairing that you think would go well with the Cuban, uh, Robbie and Randy, the the hosts of Flavor Odyssey, will um, they'll be uh, uh, creating their best drink pairings with Cubans. And I think uh, John McTavish, surgeon's going to come back because he's a bit of a uh, uh, Cuban expert. So we it'll be nice to have a Cuban expert on the show, somebody that kind of knows all of the stuff because we don't follow maybe as closely as as he does. Being Canadian and all, I mean, I, you know, I don't know how stinking Canadian. Stinking. I got Eric. I got, I got something. I got something for you, bro. Okay, I got something for you. I wish I had sent you the graphic. I didn't even know we we're going to talk about this. La Polina, before the embargo, made Cuban cigars. Really, there were Cuban La Polina made in Havana, La Polina cigars, and I will send you the graphic after this. Oh, that's it's cool. pretty cool. That is really cool. What? So that's yeah, what's going to happen Wednesday. And my um, blending and my yeah, go ahead. And my blending partner. Colin Ganley was the only dude that I know who sat on the master Salmonier panel for Habanos. It's a guy I make cigars for. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah, it's wow. real. It's All crazy. Right, folks. It's so crazy. That's, that's what we have in line uh, for Wednesday. We don't have a show lined up for next Friday. Uh, still working on a couple things, so we'll see what happens next Friday. Sammy, uh, thank you so much, my friend, for uh, taking the time on a Friday night and uh, – chatting with us on smoke night live my friend i love what you guys do it was a ton of fun you keep it light and to everybody who's out there i can tell you that this is special when guys put this together and they take their time and they go this deep with the manufacturers this is credible media i love these guys and i love what they do and i'm happy to be a part of it it's a blessing thank you very much for having me on all right, Sammy, don't go away. After the show, I have something I, I need to tell you that's kind of interesting. But, uh, folks, I love you. it's <laughs> no, maybe that, maybe that too. It's possible. I might throw that in there. Um, but, uh, guys, it's Friday night, Friday night at Herf on Dojaverse.com. Check into your favorite cigars. Hopefully, a couple La Polinas uh, float into the mix there. Uh, share what you're drinking. Do a little hashtag now playing because we like to see what you're listening to. What are you to. listening to? Uh, before the show, we were listening to some Manchester Orchestra, which was great. Uh, until next week, remember, never, never smoke, smoke alone. alone. We'll see you next week.